Chapter One of *The Little Grey Lady* by Francis Hopkinson Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. *The Little Grey Lady* by Francis Hopkinson Smith. Chapter One once in a while there comes to me out of the long ago the fragments of a story i have not thought of for years one that has been hidden in the dim lumber-room of my brain where i store my bygone memories these fragments thrust themselves out of the past as do the cuffs of an old-fashioned coat the flutings of a flounce or the lacings of a bodice from out a quickly opened bureau drawer only when you follow the cuff along the sleeve to the broad shoulder smooth out the crushed frill that swayed about her form and trace the silken thread to the waist it tightened can you determine the fashion of the day in which they were worn and with the rummaging of this lumber-room came the odours dry smells from musty old trunks packed with bundles of faded letters and worthless deeds tied with red tape musty smells from dust-covered chests iron-bound holding mouldy books their backs loose pungent smells from cracked wardrobes stuffed with moth-eaten hunting coats riding trousers and high boots with rusty spurs cross-country riders these roisterers and gamesters a sorry lot no doubt or perhaps it is an old bow-legged highboy its club feet slippered on easy rollers the kind with deep drawers kept awake by rattling brass handles its outside veneer so highly polished that you are quite sure it must have been brought up in some distinguished family the scent of old lavender and spiced rose leaves and a stick or two of white orris root hound this relic my lady's laces must be kept fresh and so must my lady's long white mitts they reach from her dainty knuckles quite to her elbow and so must her cobwebbed silk stockings and the filmy kerchief she folds across her bosom it is this kind of a drawer that i am opening now one belonging to the little grey lady as i look through its contents my eyes resting on the finger of a glove the end of a lace scarf and the handle of an old fan my mind goes back to the last time she wore them then i begin turning everything upside down lifting the corner of this incident prying under that no bit of talk recalling what he said and who told of it i shall have the whole drawer empty before i get through and whose fault it was that the match was broken off and why she of all women in the world should have remained single all those years why too she should have lost her identity so to speak and become the little grey lady and yet no sobriquet could better express her personality she was little a dainty elf-like littleness with tiny feet and wee hands she was grey a soft silver grey too grey for her forty years and this fragment begins when she was forty and she was a lady in every beat of her warm heart in every pressure of her white hand in her voice speech in all her thoughts and movements she lived in the quaintest of old houses fronted by a brick path bordered with fragrant box 
which led up to an old-fashioned porch its door brightened by a brass knocker this together with the knobs steps and slits of windows on each side of the door was kept scrupulously clean by old margaret who had lived with her for years but it is her personality and not her surroundings that lingers in my memory no one ever heard anything sweeter than her voice and nobody ever looked into a lovelier face even if there were little hollows in the cheeks and shy fan-like wrinkles lurking about the corners of her lambent brown eyes nor did her grey hair mar her beauty it was not old dry and withered a wispy grey that is not the way it happened it was a new all of a sudden grey and in less than a week so margaret once told me bleaching its brown gold to silver but the gloss remained and so did the richness of the folds and the wealth and weight of it inside the green painted door with its white trim and brass knocker and knobs there was a narrow hall hung with old portraits opening into a room literally all fireplace here there were gouty sofas and five or six big easy chairs ranged in a half circle with arms held out as if begging somebody to sit in them and here too was an embroidered worsted fire screen that slid up and down a standard to shield one's face from the blazing logs and there were queer tables and old gold curtains looped back with brass rosettes ears really behind which the tresses of the parted curtains were tucked and there were more old portraits in dingy frames and samplers under glass and a rug which some aunt had made with her own hands from odds and ends and a huge work-basket spilling worsteds and last and by no manner of means least a big schnitz-covered rocking-chair the little lady's very own its thin ankles and splay feet hidden by a modest frill there were all these things and a lot more and yet i still maintain that the room was just one big fireplace not alone because of its size and it certainly was big many a doubting curly head losing its faith in santa claus has crawled behind the old fire dogs the child's fingers tight about the little grey ladies and been told to look up into the blue a lesson never forgotten all their lives but because of the wonderful and never to be told of things which constantly took place before its blazing embers for this fireplace was the little grey lady's altar here she dispensed wisdom and cheer and love everybody in pomford village had sat in one or the other of the chairs gripped about it and had poured out their hearts to her all sorts of pourings love affairs for instance that were hopeless until she would take the girl's hand in her own and smooth out the tangle to say nothing of bickerings behind closed doors with two lives pulling apart until her dear arms brought them together but all this is only the outside of the old mahogany highboy with its meerschaum pipe polish spreadling legs and rattling handles now for the little grey lady's own particular drawer End of chapter one Chapter two of The Little Grey Lady by Francis Hopkinson Smith This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Carolyn Chapter two 
it was christmas eve and kate dayton one of pomford's pretty girls had found the little grey lady sitting alone before the fire gazing into the ashes her small frame almost hidden in the roomy chair the winter twilight had long since settled and only the flickering blaze of the logs and the dim glow from one lone candle illumined the room this strange to say was placed on a table in a corner where its rays shed but little light in the room oh cousin annie moaned kate everybody in pomford who got close enough to touch the little grey lady's hand called her cousin annie it was only the outside world who knew her by her other sobriquet i didn't mean anything mark came in just at the wrong minute and-and the poor girl's tears smothered the rest don't let him go dearie came the answer when she had heard the whole story the girl on her knees her head in her lap the wee hand stroking the fluff of golden hair dishevelled in her grief oh but he won't stay moaned kate he says he is going to rio way out to south america to join his uncle harry he won't go dearie not if you tell him the truth and make him tell you the truth don't let your pride come in don't beat around the bush or make believe you are hurt or misunderstood or that you don't care you do care better be a little humble now than humble all your life it only takes a word hold out your hand and say i'm sorry mark please forgive me if he loves you and he does the girl raised her head oh cousin annie how do you know she laughed gently because he was here dearie half an hour ago and told me so he thought you owed him the dance and he was a little jealous of tom but tom had asked me yes and so had mark yes but he had no right she was up in arms again she wouldn't she couldn't and again an outburst of tears choked her words the little grey lady had known kate's mother now dead and what might have happened but for a timely word and she knew to her own sorrow what had happened for want of one kate and mark should not repeat that experience if she could help it she had saved the mother in the old days by just such a word she would save the daughter in the same way and the two were much alike same slight girlish figure same blond hair and blue eyes same expression and the same impetuous high-strung temperament if that child's own mother walked in this minute i couldn't tell em apart they do favour one another so old margaret had told her mistress when she opened the door for the girl and she was right pomford village was full of these hereditary likenesses mark dabney whom all the present trouble was about was so like his father at his age that his uncle harry had picked mark out on a crowded dock when the lad had visited him in rio the year before although he had not seen the boy's father for twenty years so strong was the family likeness if there was to be a quarrel it must not be between the dabneys and the daytons of all families there had been suffering enough in the old days listen dearie she said in her gentle crooning tone patting the girl's cheek as she talked a quarrel where there is no love is soon forgotten but a difference when both love may if not quickly healed 
leave a scar that will last through life there are as good fish in the sea as were ever caught cried the girl in sheer bravado brushing away her tears don't believe it dearie and don't ever say it that has wrecked more lives than you know that is what i once knew a girl to say a girl just about your age but she found somebody else and that's just what i'm going to do i'm not going to have mark read me a lecture every time i want to do something he doesn't like didn't your girl find somebody else no never she is still unmarried yes but it wasn't her fault was it yes although she did not know it at the time she opened a door suddenly and found her lover alone with another girl the two had stolen off together where they would not be interrupted he was pleading for his college friend straightening out just some such foolish quarrel as you have had with mark but the girl would not understand nor did she know the truth until a year afterward then it was too late the little grey lady stopped lifted her hand from the girl's head and turned her face toward the now dying fire and what became of him asked the girl in a hushed voice as if she dared not awaken the memory he went away and she has never seen him since for some minutes there was silence then kate said in a braver tone and he married somebody else no oh, well then she died no the little lady had not moved nor had she taken her eyes from the blaze she seemed to be addressing some invisible body who could hear and understand the girl felt its influence and a tremor ran through her the fitful blaze casting weird shadows helped this feeling at last with an effort she asked you say you know them both cousin annie yes he was my dear friend i was just thinking of him when you came in the charred logs broke into a heap of coals the blaze flickered and died but for the lone candle in the corner the room would have been in total darkness shall i light another candle cousin annie shivered the girl or bring that one nearer no it's christmas eve and i only light one candle on christmas eve but what's one candle why father has the whole house as bright as day and every fire blazing the girl sprang to her feet and stepped nearer the hearth she would be less nervous she thought if she moved about and then the warmth of the fire was somehow reassuring please let me light them all cousin annie she pleaded reaching out her hand towards a cluster in an old-fashioned candelabra and if there aren't enough i'll get more from margaret no no one will do it is an old custom of mine i've done it for twenty years but don't you love christmas kate argued her nervousness increasing the ghostly light and the note of pain in her companion's voice were strangely affecting the little grey lady leaned forward in her chair and looked long and steadily at the heap of smouldering ashes then she answered slowly each word vibrating with the memory of some hidden sorrow i've had mine dearie but you can have some more urged kate not like those that have gone before dearie no not like those something in the tones of her voice and quick droop of the dear head stirred the girl to her depths 
sinking to her knees she hid her face in the little lady's lap and you sit here in the dark with only one candle she whispered yes always she answered her fingers stroking the fair hair i can see those i have loved better in the dark sometimes the room is full of people i have often to strain my eyes to assure myself that the door is really shut all sorts of people come the girls and boys i knew when i was young some are dead some are far away some so near that should i open the window and shout their names many of them could hear there are fewer above the ground every year but i welcome all who come it's the old maid's hour you know this twilight hour the wives are making ready the supper the children are romping lovers are together in the corner where they can whisper and not be overheard but none of this disturbs me no big man bursts in letting in the cold i have my chair my candle my thoughts and my fire when you get to be my age kate and live alone and you might dearie if mark should leave you you will love these twilight hours too the girl reached up her hands and touched the little grey lady's cheek whispering but aren't you very very lonely cousin annie yes sometimes for a moment kate remained silent then she asked in a faltering voice through which ran a note almost of terror do you think i shall ever be like like that is i shall ever be all alone i don't know dearie no one can ever tell what will happen i never thought twenty years ago i should be all alone but i am the girl raised her head and with a cry of pain threw her arms around the little grey lady's neck oh no no i can't bear it she sobbed i'll tell mark i'll send for him to-night before i go to bed End of chapter two Chapter Three of The Little Grey Lady by Francis Hopkinson Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Three. It was not until Kate Dayton reached her father's gate that the spell wrought by the flickering firelight and the dim glow of the ghostly candle wore off the crisp air of the winter night for it was now quite dark had helped but the sight of mark's waiting figure striding along the snow-covered path to her home and his manly outspoken apology please forgive me kate i made an awful fool of myself followed by her joyous refrain oh mark i've been so wretched had done more it had all come just as cousin annie had said there had been neither pride nor anger only the little grey lady's timely word but if the spell was broken the pathetic figure of the dear woman her eyes fixed on the dying embers still lingered in kate's mind oh mark it is so pitiful to see her and i got so frightened the whole room seemed filled with ghosts christmas seems her loneliest time she won't have but one candle lighted and she sits and mopes in the dark oh it's dreadful i tried to cheer her up but she says she likes to sit in the dark because then all the dead people she loves can come to her can't we do something to make her happy she is so lovely and she is so little and she is so dear they had entered the house now a blaze of light 
kate's father was standing on the hearth-rug his back to a great fireplace filled with roaring logs where have you two gadabouts been he laughed merrily what do you mean by staying out to this late don't you know it's christmas eve we've been to see cousin annie daddy and it would make your heart ache to look at her she's there all alone can't you go down and bring her up here yes i could but she wouldn't come not on christmas eve did she have her candle burning yes just one poor little miserable candle that hardly gave any light at all and it was in the corner on a little table yes all by itself poor dear she always lights it she's lighted it for almost twenty years is it for somebody she loved who died no it's for somebody she loved who is alive but who never came back and won't he studied them both for a moment as if in doubt then he added in a determined voice motioning them to a seat beside him it is about time you two children heard the story straight for it concerns you both so i'll tell you your uncle harry mark is the man who never came back and won't he was just your age at the time he and annie were to be married in a few months then everything went to smash and it was your mother kate who was the innocent cause of his exile harry who was the best friend i had in the world tried to put in a good word for me this was before i and your mother were engaged and annie coming in and finding them got it all crooked instead of waiting until harry could explain she flared up and off he went her hair turned to white in a week when she found out how she had misjudged him but it was too late then harry wouldn't come back and he never will when he told you mark last year in rio that he was coming home christmas i knew he would change his mind just as soon as you left him and he did queer boy harry once he gets an idea in his head it sticks there he was that way when he was a boy he'll never come back as long as annie lives and that means never he stopped a moment spread his fingers to the blazing logs and then with a smile on his face said if ever i catch you two young turtle doves making such fools of yourselves i'll turn you both outdoors and again his hearty laugh rang through the cheery room the girl instinctively leaned closer to her lover she had heard some part of the story before in fact both of them had but never in its entirety her heart went out to the little grey lady all the more mark now spoke up he too had had an hour of his own with the little grey lady and the obligation still remained unsettled well if she won't come up here and have christmas with us he cried why can't we go down there and have christmas with her let's surprise her kate let's clean out all those dead people i know she sits in the dark and imagines they all come back for i've seen her that way many a time when i drop in on her in the late afternoon let's show her they're alive kate started up and caught mark's arm oh mark i have it she whispered and we will yes that will be the very thing and so with more mumblings and mutterings not one word of which could her father hear the two raced upstairs to the top of the house and the garret End of chapter three
Chapter Four of *The Little Grey Lady* by Francis Hopkinson Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Four. Two hours later, a group of young people, led by Mark Dabney, trooped out of Kate's gate and turned down the Little Grey Lady's street most of them wore long cloaks and were muffled in thick veils they were talking in low tones glancing from side to side as if fearing to be seen the moon had gone under a cloud but the light of the stars aided by an isolated street lamp showed them the way so careful were they to conceal their identity that the whole party there were six in all would dart into an open gate crouching behind the snow-laden hedge to avoid even a single passer-by only once were they in any danger and that was when a sleigh gliding by stopped in front of them the driver calling out in a voice which sounded twice as loud in the white stillness where's mr dabney's new house evidently a stranger for the town pump was not better known no one else stopped them until they reached the little grey lady's porch kate crept up first followed by mark and peered in so far as she could see everything was just as she had left it the candle is still burning mark and she's put more wood on the fire but i can't find her oh yes there she is in her big chair you can just see the top of her head and her hand hush don't one of you breathe now listen girls mark and i will tiptoe in first the front door is never fastened and if she is asleep and i think she is we will all crouch down behind her until she wakes up and another thing whispered mark from behind his hand everybody must drop their coats and things in the hall so we can surprise her all at once the strange procession tiptoed in and arranged itself behind the little grey lady's chair kate was dressed in her mother's wedding gown flaring poke bonnet and long faded gloves clear to her shoulder mark had on a blue coat with brass buttons a buff waistcoat and black stock the two points of the high collar pinching his ruddy cheeks the same dress his father and uncle harry had worn and all the young bloods of their day for that matter the others were in their grandmother's or grandfather's short and long clothes tom fields sporting a tight-sleeved high-collared coat silk embroidered waistcoat and pumps kate crept up behind her chair but mark moved to the fireplace and rested his elbow on the mantel so that he would be in full view when the little grey lady awoke at last her eyes opened but she made no outcry nor did she move except to lift her head as does a fawn startled by some sudden light her wandering eyes drinking in the apparition mark hardly breathing stood like a statue but kate bending closer heard her catch her breath with a long indrawn sigh and next the half audible words no it isn't so how foolish i am and there came softly harry and again in almost a whisper as if hope had died in her heart harry kate half frightened sprang forward and flung her arms around the little grey lady why don't you know him 
it's mark cousin nanny and here's tom and nanny fields and everybody and we're going to light all the candles every one of them and make an awful big fire and have a real real christmas the little grey lady was awake now oh you scared me so she cried rising to her feet rubbing her eyes you foolish children i must have been asleep yes i know i was she greeted them all talking and entering into their fun the spirit of hospitality now hers saying over and over again how glad she was they came kissing one and another telling them how happy they made her how since they had been kind enough to come she would let them have a real christmas only she added quickly it will have to be by the light of one candle but that won't make any difference because you can pile on just as much wood as you choose yes she continued her voice rising in her effort to meet them on their own joyous plane pile on all the kindling too mark and kate dear please run and tell margaret to bring in every bit of cake she has in the pantry oh how like your mother you are kate i remember that very dress and you mark why you've got on the same coat i saw your father wear at the governor's ball and you too tom oh what a good time we will have soon the lid of the old piano was raised a spinet really and one of the girls began running her fingers over the keys and later on it was agreed that the first dance was to be the virginia reel with all the hospitable chairs and the fire screen and the gouty old sofa rolled back against the wall this all arranged mark took his place with the little grey lady for a partner the music struck up a lively tune and as quickly ceased as the sound of bells rang through the night air in the hush that followed a sleigh was heard at the gate kate sprang up and clapped her hands oh they are just in time there come the rest of them cousin annie now we are going to have a great party let's be dancing when they come in keep on playing at this instant the door opened and margaret put in her head somebody she said with a low bow wants to see mr mark on business mark looking like a gallant of the old school excused himself with a great flourish to the little grey lady and strode out in the hall with his back to the light stood a broad-shouldered man muffled to the chin in a fur overcoat the boy was about to apologize for his costume and then ask the man's errand when the stranger turned quickly and gripped his wrist hush not a word where is she he cried with a low whistle of surprise mark pushed open the door the stranger stepped in the little grey lady raised her head and who can this guest be she asked and in what a queer costume too the man drew himself up to his full height and threw wide his coat and you don't know me annie she did not take her eyes from his face nor did she move except to turn her head appealingly to the room as if she feared they were playing her another trick he had reached her side and stood looking down at her again came the voice a strong clear voice with a note of infinite tenderness through it how white your hair is annie and your hand is so thin have i changed like this she leaned forward scanning him eagerly 
there was a little cry then all her soul went out in the one word harry she was inside the big coat now his strong arms around her her head hidden on his breast only the tips of her toes on the floor when he had kissed her again and again and he did and before everybody he crossed the room picked up the ghostly candle and smothered its flame i saw it from the road he laughed softly that's why i couldn't wait but you'll never have to light it again my darling i saw them both a few years later everything in the way of fading and wrinkling had stopped so far as the little grey lady was concerned if there were any lines left in her forehead and around the corners of her eyes i could not find them joy had planted a crop of dimples instead and they had spread out smoothing the care lines margaret even claimed that her hair was turning brown gold once more but then margaret was always her loyal slave and believed everything her mistress wished and now if you don't mind dear reader we will put everything back and shut the little grey lady's bureau drawer End of chapter four End of The Little Grey Lady by Frances Hopkinson Smith Read by Carolyn in June two thousand and thirteen in Groningen, the Netherlands Thank you for listening.